Hey, good morning. If you've got your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them to the book of 1 John. It's a pistol near the back. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. As you're turning in that, uh, I just want to thank you for this past week. Uh, we had Easter Sunday, and we had our three services uh, here. Uh, we had over 4,000 people in worship, which was the first time we've had 4,000 in seven years. And uh, we also had another 500 that were watching us on live stream. So well over 4,500 people were involved with us in worship. And I especially want to thank, uh, we had, uh, I think it was about 447 volunteers in order to pull off that, uh, those three services. And so thank you, Shades, for that. And some of you, we even had to turn you away. Uh, you said, hey, I'm willing to help. We said, hey, we got enough. So just your willingness to do that was incredible. So thank you very much for that. Uh, today, we're moving towards the close of this book. Uh, we have been for about two months in this book of 1 John. And as you get near the end, uh, he is going to give us some assurances and some certainties. And in fact, in verses 13 through 21, he uses the word know, K-N-O-W. He uses the word know six times. We know, we know, you know, we know on there. And so as I looked at it, I wanted to break it into two different messages and talk about assurances and certainties and look at the first three. And then next week, we'll close out the book and look at the last three on there. When you think about assurances and certainties, the things that are certain in life, uh, when I was growing up, I always heard that statement, there's two things that are certain in life, and it is death and taxes. And, and then I read where someone says, death and taxes are inevitable, but death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. So, uh, <laughs> So there is inevitability uh, with death and taxes, but there are other things that are inevitable. I mean, it's just, you just know it's going to be certain. Uh, probably each one of these young parents could stand up to you today and say, it was something we knew inevitable that would happen. Either the child would get sick or spit up on their favorite outfit or, or kept us up all night. These things happen. I know. I went through a, a parent dedication myself. And it's just you know these things are going to happen. You know that when whatever line you choose at the supermarket, it's going to be the slow line. It's the one where the person's struggling with some coupons. Uh, they're not really certain if this is the item that they wanted. They thought it was a two-for-one, but then they weren't sure. And then when it comes time to pay, they're trying to pay with 1983 traveler's checks. And so you're there saying, this is kind of like driving me crazy. Or real quickly, uh, I've just got a few minutes, so I'm going to drive through Starbucks, pick something up real quick. There's only one car in front of me. And it just so happens to be the one car that's buying things for the office. And so, but yet they don't really quite remember what they were. So if you could give them a menu so they could review, so they could get everybody's order correct. It just seems to happen. And so when uh, John talks about assurances and certainties, he's talking about six things, theological truths that drastically impact our lives, drastically. And so we want to take a look at those. And the very first one is this, the assurance of salvation. And we will start in verse 13, and let's just read verses 13 through 17, and then start by talking about assurance of salvation. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his, <clears throat> his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Let's talk about the first part of this passage, and that is the assurance of salvation. As a pastor, there are a number of questions I get, and a number of times I counsel with people, and one of the top two questions I get where people come to me is this question, how can I know that I'm saved? How can I know that I'm saved? I've got questions. I've got doubts. I'm just not real certain. Can you be certain that you are saved? And I go to this verse, it's probably, it is like the go-to verse because when John writes this, he writes this to give people an assurance that yes, 
you can know for certain that you have been saved. This epistle is written to people just like us, people who've received Christ as Savior, if you've, if you've made that decision. And yet at the same time, they have questions, just like many times we have questions. Am I really a believer or not? I did this particular sin or I did that particular sin or I'm struggling in this particular area. Does that mean that I'm lost and that I do not have eternal life? And so John is made it clear throughout these chapters as to what it means to be saved. He's been very clear about who Jesus is. He says he is deity. He is the son of God. He was 100% man and 100% God. And he came and he died for our sins and was raised from the dead uh, on the third day. He has conquered sin and he gives us the opportunity to have eternal life. So he's laid all of that out there. And he gives us the invitation to invite Jesus to come into our life and to be the Lord and to be the Savior of our life. And when he talks about salvation, he talks about the eternal character of God and the only kind of salvation that God gives is eternal because it's consistent with, with his character. And so he says, you can know. And that's why when people come and sit down in my office and say, I just don't know, can I know? Yeah, look what 1 John 5, 13 says. It says you can know that you are saved. Well, well, then how can I know? Let me just give you about three things that we can write and look at passages. Number one, the reason you can know that you are saved is you are securely in God's hand. When you make a decision for Christ, you are securely in God's hand. In John chapter 10, verses 28 through 29, Jesus says, for those who hear my voice and follow me, this is it. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand and my Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now look at that closely. Jesus says, hey, no one will snatch them out of my hand. And he says, no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. You've got like a double security. You've got in the hands of Christ, the hands of the Father. When you make a decision for Christ, he says, I've placed you in my hands. You have eternal life. And nobody can take it out of my hands. It's like when you had your, when your children were real young and maybe about two years old or so and, and you know, you would do these little games about which hand is this in and, uh, and, you know, you put it in this hand and you didn't have it in this one. They touched this one and you showed it was empty and they know it's this hand, right? They're fired up. They say, it's here. And I said, I don't know. Look at it. And they try to pry your fingers and they can't. I hope, <laughs> unless you've got Samson. I think you're okay. But, you know, you just hold them tight like that, and they're trying as hard as they can to pry them open. You're kind of playing with them, and there's no way they can because you're stronger than they are. And this is like God's hand. He's got us in that hand, and there is that salvation. You are set for eternal life. And he says, if you're securely in my hand, nobody is going to take you out of my hands. Let me give you a second reason. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Once you make a decision to receive Christ Jesus into your heart, it says that God's Spirit comes to live in you, the Holy Spirit. Look what he says, Paul says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of an inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It says he is the guarantee of our inheritance. He is our down payment. And in essence, what he is saying is that when you make a decision to receive Christ into your heart, God's Spirit comes into your heart, and his presence is the down payment of saying, you are sealed, you are saved, and this is a down payment that one day when you die, you will spend eternity with God, and then one day you will get your resurrection body. All the things that are promised, this is the down payment right here. So we're securely in God's hand, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so what is the result of that? Well, I wrote down the result of that is confidence and joy. It is increased confidence and joy. And see, the sad thing is that some people say, well, if I'm secure, it means I can live life whatever way I want to because, hey, once saved, always saved on there. I look at it just the opposite. I look at it is that when you made a decision for Christ and God says, Danny, you are my child, you'll always be my child, you've been adopted into my family, it means that I can live life with confidence and with joy. 
that I'm not worried that every time I slip up or I commit a sin or I begin to head down a different path that all of a sudden God says, you've lost your salvation. It's not like that every night when I go to bed and I get nervous and say, did I commit some sin that means if I died in the middle of the night, I would spend eternity separated from God. That would just be living a life of fear. But it's a life of confidence and of joy, of knowing that I am his child and that my uh, eternity is secure. And for those that would say, I look at it as a license to sin, I would go back to chapter 219 when it said, those who were with us, they are no longer with us because they were never of us. They came to church, they did the stuff, but now we realize they were really never believers. They were just all more or less pretenders. And if you feel like that this is just a license to sin, then you need to go back to stage one and say, have I really ever made a decision for Christ? Because it says when that happens, there's a transformation that takes place in your heart. The old dies, the new comes, and there's a willingness to go, to follow him, deny self, take up your cross, and follow God. And so for those that are saved, this is an incredible confidence and joy because I'm not constantly worrying about something else. I feel like I've got this safety. Uh, I remember uh, Janice and I, uh, when we, we traveled to San Francisco, when they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge, it was, it was started construction in 1936. And I got intrigued by the history of that because I cannot imagine what fool would ever want to work on that. I just got to tell you. I mean, that's when men were men. I mean, I, I, I just, I would look at the pictures and I just have to turn my head. I said, there's no way a guy did that up on there. Well, it was interesting because during that day, they had a belief that uh, you figure out how much the project would cost, and for every million dollars that the project costs, you'll lose one person. One person will die in the construction. The project was $35 million, so they projected 35 people would die in the midst of the construction. Now, that makes you just a tad nervous when you sign up to, to, to work over here. So they wanted to try to do as good a job as possible, so they in, introduced some safety measures. One was hard hats, and the other was harnesses to strap yourself in. And, and I've read accounts on where some people thought that was kind of wussy, and they weren't really going to strap themselves in, but they forced them to. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. And so they had harnesses. But then the man came up with an amazing idea, and that is we are going to build a safety net of steel mesh that would go underneath the bridge construction and would go from one end to the other end. And by putting that safety net there, it means that if somebody fell, most likely they would fall right into that net and it would save their life. They implemented that. And they said once they implemented it, there was a difference. And the difference is that they, the workers that were on this bridge felt a sense of security. It removed a fear of falling. It increased the morale. It enabled the men to work faster and for them to be confident in what they were doing because they weren't always worrying about falling because they knew if they slipped and fell, they had a safety net for them. That's the way it is for us as believers. We're not going to have to live perfect lives. We can't live perfect lives. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to sin. But the thing is, is we've got this safety net of a God who loves us. And, it, and, and when I mess up and I fall, I'm in that net. It's like his arms. He says, Danny, you know, I've never left you. You're still in my hand right here. And he said, but let's see if we can get back on. Let's get back on the bridge. Let's get back on this and, and keep following me in the way that you need to follow me. That's why I say the result of this first assurance, it is confidence and it is also joy. I, I think about, um, it was um, 1 Timothy 1.12. There was a song that was written, For I Know Whom I Have Believed In. And we've sung this. Uh, it was an old hymn, For I Know Whom I Have Believed In and Am Persuaded That He Is Able. And uh, it says, uh, uh, He's able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. And uh, it takes it straight out of 1 Timothy 1.20. See, I, I know, there's no doubt in my mind that the one who I committed my life to, He's able to keep me. He's going to keep me till the end. We have an assurance of salvation. But the second assurance we have that he says in verses 14 through 17, it's an assurance that God hears and answers our prayers. It's an assurance that God hears and answers our prayers. Verse 14, 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have toward him 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is the confidence that we have. We have a confidence. That means that when we go to God in prayer, we have confidence. Not cockiness, but confidence. It means we can be open, but at the same time, reverential and be submissive. But we have confidence. Confidence in what? That we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The key part is according to his will. If we ask anything according to his will, it says he hears our prayers. So how do you know if you're praying according to God's will? Well, let's just show what he's shown in Scripture. First of all, you continually abide in Christ. Continually abide in Christ. And that's found in John 15, 7. Continually abide in Christ. In John 15, 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now look at that promise. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. When we abide in Christ, it means we're in such harmony with God's purpose that the yearning of our hearts match up with the yearning of his heart, and we are praying according to his will. So you continually abide in Christ. But number two is this, you obey God's commands. Continue to abide in Christ, obey God's commands, and this is exactly what John said in, in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 22. And he says this, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. We keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. We seek to live our life in a way that pleases God. We obey his commands. We love one another. Everything that we've talked about over these last four chapters here in this book. Then there's this quality of intimacy that touches the heart of God. And we got prayers that are springing out of this fruitful, intimate relationship with God. I'm abiding with Christ. I'm obeying his commands. And when I am doing that, then I am better understanding the heart of God. And so the answers to our prayers are predicated to the obedience to God's commands. Obedience and intimacy will lead to answers of prayers, which then takes you to the third point, and that is submit to God's will. Submit to God's will. And you get that from Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, and that's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he's getting ready to go to the cross, and he's praying with his disciples, and right before his arrest, he's praying to God. And he says, if there's any other way that you can remove this cup, that cup was the wrath of God that was going to be poured out on him on the cross. If there's any other way to remove this, boy, it'd be great if you would. However, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. We submit to God's will. Prayer becomes not only a time of petitioning, but of yielding your life to the will and the work of God. Prayer is not us trying to get God to see things my way and get things that I want that are contrary to his will. Prayer is submitting my will to his will. It is yielding my desires to his desires. And the wonder of prayer is not bringing God's will down to us, but is lifting our will up to him. It is submitting my will to him. Now you just think about this. He says, I'll give you assurance that God hears your prayer and I'll give you assurance that God answers your prayer. What do you need to do? He said, well, you need to abide in Christ. You need to have that close fellowship with him. You need to obey God's commands and then you take your will and you yield it to him. He says, once you do that, then all of a sudden, you're going to be on some strong praying ground. And in fact, in verse 15, that's what he says. In verse 15, he says, And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, and we know we have the request that we have asked of him, and if we know that he hears us, he just talked about that in verse 14. How do you know that God hears you? Well, you just did the things that we laid out. You abide with Christ, you're obedient to his commands, you submit your will to his, his will, and he says, then, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And that means that God will answer those prayers. And the reason is, is because my will is connected with God's will, and I'm praying in accordance with his will, and he's going to answer those prayers because it's best for all humankind or best for me, and most of all, best for expanding his kingdom. 
And so he says, this is how you can know that your prayers will be answered. However, God still controls the timing. <laughs> Some of those answers could be pretty quick. Some could be the next day. Some could be the next week. Some could be longer, maybe months, maybe years. And for some, they may be beyond your lifetime. Oftentimes, I've read stories of revivals that took place in a particular pocket or an area. And they will always try to trace the roots of the revival. And it's usually interesting because there was a group of people that had a burden for that area and they began to pray. And they were consistent in their praying. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and nothing happened. It didn't seem. And some of them died and went to glory. But those prayers were there. And God says, I'm going to answer your prayers, but it's going to come at this time. And then all of a sudden, they began to see incredible revival began to take place. There are even some people on a smaller scale who says that when a child was born, there was a grandparent that was praying for that child. And it's like almost as if God impressed something about that child and they prayed for them. And, and they prayed for either something special or prayed that they go into missions or, or mission or ministry or something. But there was something they prayed for. And, and then as that child began to grow up, that grandparent didn't live to see that. And then it's interesting because then all of a sudden when the trajectory of that child's life took place and it went in a direction that God was honored and then they look back and they get in discussions and it's so fun to say, you know, your grandmother or your grandfather prayed for you for all those years on that. And, and God answered that prayer. It just was on his timing and not on our timing. Now, you got to be real careful on these verses. You cannot lift these verses out of its context. Because if you do, you will treat God as some celestial slot machine where you just stick the coin in there and pull the lever and then you get your answer. Some Aladdin's lamp that if I just say a few prayers and I'll rub the lamp and I'll say, boom, I got my answer over here. And it's not a blank check prayer to where I just say, hey, hey pray. <laughs> I was looking for 100,000, let's go too. Uh, I mean, it, it is nothing like that. You have to keep it in context about being connected to him and abiding him and obeying his commands and your will being submitted uh, to his will on there. And, you know, as I thought through this, I said, you know, some people may respond to it and say, that's just too tough. All I want to do is just pray. If I got to do all this other stuff, I'd just like to shoot a flare up to God real quick and say, hey, I got some problem. Can you work it out for me? I'd love to just be able to live life like I want to and then get a 911 request to God when things are bad. Hey, I can't pay the bills. Or I got a problem with a kid over here. I got some hassle with my job. I got a health scare. So can I just do a 911 to him? Will that work out okay on that? Listen, this is not about us. This is about our relationship with God and for him being honored and glorified. And so we desire to live a life that is so connected with him that our will and his will are right in tune. And that's the beauty of living the Christian life. And it's not the fact that I just want to do 911 prayers on there. Oh, there'll be times when we will be shooting up a 911 prayer. But I'd like to be shooting it up after I'm abiding with him, obeying his commands, and yielding my will to him and saying, God, you know the ox is in the ditch and I really need your help now. And, you know, to me, I'm challenged by this passage to say, you know, I want to work to be even closer in my walk with him because I want my prayer life to be so connected with him in that what he desires is what I desire and that we can walk through life together like that. And so all of this that he's told us, he says, you've got assurance that God will hear your prayers and assurance that God will answer your prayers. So what's the result of that? Intercede for believers that are entangled in sin. One of the results of what we get to do is we get to intercede for believers whose lives are entangled in sin. This takes the focus off you and me. You know, you could take it, we could have taken these couple of verses and really focused just for ourselves and looked at our whole life and said, if I'm getting right with God, I'm right on praying ground, and he and I are just going to be living life like this. No, I think what all throughout here talks about you need to love your brother. And uh, there even there was a passage in chapter 3, verse 16 that says we should even give our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, if you're supposed to give your life for a brother and sister in Christ, I think you should also be willing to pray for them. It says in verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask 
and God will give him life. He shall ask, and God will give him life. It means that we are to intercede for those who are caught up in some kind of sin. And we can pray for them and pray in confidence that God will give them victory and help them to overcome that particular sin that they're getting enmeshed with or that particular temptation that they're walking into. And pray that there be a renewed repentance in their life and that they would now begin to walk in the light of God. And this is a great incentive for us to pray for others who are caught up in, in sin and temptation. And I just got to be real straight. There's a lot of times as Christians that um, when somebody gets caught up in some kind of sin or some kind of temptation, oftentimes first response is gossip and second response is rejoicing. Just being real honest with you. And sometimes it is, you know, life's been good with them. It's about time they, something happened bad to them. And, uh, and we see them going through that struggle. And sometimes when we see someone else going through that struggle, it makes us feel a little bit better. Hey, man, I'm not in that bad of a struggle. I was feeling pretty convicted, but, but not now. Uh, and and then sometimes we'll look at them and, and, uh, and we'll say, well, well, that's good. They need to be knocked down a notch or two. And, and uh, all of a sudden, we're not doing what he says here in Scripture. He says, when you see a brother or sister that's caught in sin, going through temptation, going through this struggle, your first response is not just to gossip to tell other people about it. Your first response is not to rejoice on that. Your first response is, God, I'm going to intercede for them. And you know what, Lord? I know that when I'm praying, this is a prayer that you want to answer. Because it says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is what your desire is and so I'm standing on praying ground I'm praying for this particular person we intercede for those who are entangled in sin and then there comes that that statement where it says that there is sin that leads to death and I don't say that one should pray for that all wrongdoing is sin but there is sin that does not lead to death now what it's saying is there's a sin that does not lead to death uh, to eternal death which means that if you're a believer in Christ all sin has punishment to it however it says there is a sin that leads to death it's a sin that is has been called unpardonable unforgivable and that sin is next week we're going to talk about, uh, about that. And I will pray for you and hope that you don't do that one. And, um, but it'll be a great way to open the service uh, on there. We've taken a list of all people that are here. And, uh, and if you're not here next Sunday, we're just going to assume, yikes, it was that sin uh, on that. So, so, so what is that? They say, what is that sin that leads, leads to death? Seriously, what is that sin that leads to death? Um, in the, uh, Jesus calls it what's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Bottom line, sin that leads to death is when a person rejects Christ as Savior. It is when you reject the Holy Spirit. It is that there's a conviction that comes. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, which, which he does for every person. And when we're convicted of sin and we hear the truth of Christ, we have to make that decision. Do I accept it or do I reject it? If you have accepted it, you've become a part of God's family, then there's no fear of you committing the unpardonable sin. However, if you reject that, he says there's a great fear that if you continue to reject it, your heart will get so hardened that you'll never let him in. And when you die, you'll spend eternity separated from God. That is the sin that leads to death. John Calvin put it this way. It's a resistance in one's heart against the truth of God, even though one is touched with the glory of that truth. Even though your heart's been touched with the glory of that truth, there is just a resistance in your heart. And that's a sin that leads to death. And it's unforgiven, and it remains unforgiven because the only person that can forgive us of our sins is Jesus Christ. And if you reject Jesus Christ, then there's no way you can get a pardon for your sins. That's why they would call it an unpardonable sin because you've rejected the only one that can pardon your sins on that. And so I always tell believers, if you're truly a believer, you don't need to worry about that sin. And then some people come to me, I worry if I've ever committed it. I said, well, just the fact you're worried about it means you've not done it, Okay. 
So, so we're going to be okay on that. Assurances and certainties. There's assurance of salvation. You can know that you know that you are saved. And there's the assurance of God hearing and answering your prayers. Abiding in Christ. Obeying his commands. Yielding your spirit to him. Submitting yourself to God. And when this happens, then God hears your prayers and he answers your prayers. And as you continue to walk with him and understand that you are securely in the hand of God, you've got that assurance of salvation. And uh, that should, to me, I would think would give you confidence and would give you joy. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us words of assurance in your word. And uh, Lord, Satan tries to trip us up, tries to bring doubt in our mind over things that you have declared to be true. So I pray for each person here and that uh, in this day, there would be assurances, and they would feel that certainty, and they'd feel stronger in their walk with you. There would be confidence, there would be joy, and then there would be a, even a deeper heart and concern for those that struggle with sin. And may we take it as our responsibility of knowing that we have access to you, the Heavenly Father, that when we see people that are caught up and meshed in a life of sin, that we can pray for them and pray that they would be released from that and they can get back into that right relationship and walk with you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.